everyone and welcome to the fifth concurrent session of INGET 2021. Uh, we'll have Julia Bilinova and she will be giving her talk on Asynchronous Speaking Club, the hows and the whys. Um, good luck, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, hello everybody and welcome to my talk. My name is Julia and I'm going to be talking about this magical beast called the Synchronous Speaking Club. Um, you can see that I'm quite an experienced educator. I've been teaching adults mostly uh, for over 12 years now, and I work with them one to one. That's an important thing to remember. Uh, I'm based now in Kaliningrad, Russia, uh, even though I'm originally from Moscow. Uh, if you know where Kaliningrad is, let me know in the chat box. So far, nobody has been able to tell me where it is, uh, besides myself. Uh, and uh, I'm interested in psychology of learning, motivation, and technology in uh, teaching English. So this is what we're going to be talking about today. And in my talk, I'm going to start with the whys. I'm going to explain why I decided to set up a club like this. Then we're going to go through the three aspects of such a club. You know, it's asynchronous first, then um, it's speaking, and then it's a club. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about troubleshooting too, and I'll share the outcomes of the projects with you. If we have time uh, for a Q&A session, I'll be very happy to take your questions. So, the whys. I don't know about you, but this is what my adult students quite often uh, tell me, that they would love to do more speaking than they're able to do in class, that they want to speak English, but there is nobody around them who knows the language, and they want to practice, but they are short of time. You, you know, it's a busy world, and I work with adults, so this is always an issue. If you can relate, uh, if you've heard something like this from your students, please let me know in the chat box. Um, anyway, uh, I kept hearing, hearing uh, these things from my students, and I decided that if these are the problems, then I can potentially solve them. And my solution was the Synchronous Speaking Club. Asynchronous meaning that you can do it anytime, um, anywhere, which means, which kind of, you know, solves the problem of I don't have time. It's speaking, so if you don't have anybody around you can, who can speak the language, they're kind of, the people are provided. And uh, it's a club uh, which, you know, creates this warm, comfortable atmosphere where people, even those who are maybe introverts or are kind of not confident enough to speak with strangers, they can speak, they can practice, and they can get better at it. So let's take a look at the house. How do we make it asynchronous? I have already said that asynchronous means that uh, this is something that can happen at any time in any place. And my students need to be able to um, access it anywhere at any time. So there were two points that I had to consider. First, equipment. What is this thing that everybody has with them at all times these days? The answer is very simple. Your smartphone, right? Uh, everybody has this technology, at least all of my students had it. So I decided to utilize it. And when I was thinking about what um, program, what app to use, um, I uh, decided to go with something that is very, very familiar for them. And I think it's important because the whole idea of an asynchronous speaking club is already brand new. So a bit of something that, you know, we know a bit about can really help. My solution was WhatsApp. Um, again, I decided uh, to use it because it's accessible on phones and phones are carried everywhere these days. And all of my students uh, were using it. We uh, actually, they were even using it with me uh, to settle different admin questions. Sometimes I asked them to record themselves as part of their homework and to send me the recordings on WhatsApp. I don't know what would be better for your students, but do consider the two aspects, equipment and technology. It has to be accessible, it has to be there, it has to be familiar. So how do we manage the speaking part? Because you know that quite often people 
text on WhatsApp. However, it does this have uh, it does have this wonderful feature of um, you know you can record yourself and send a voice message. So this is what I wanted them to do: send only voice messages and not you know to go go back to texting, uh, creating texts. No, it's a speaking club, right? And I wanted them um, to use English only. Uh, they were all sharing the same L1, so that was a kind of you know, a danger for me, something to think about, to consider. Uh, uh, and I also wanted them to engage in real communication. By this, I mean, discuss topics uh, which um, would be interesting and, you know, uh, relatable for them and not to communicate with me. I mean, they chat enough with me in class. That's quite enough. I wanted them to engage with other people, with other members, with other clubbers. So how was I supposed to do that? And my solution was establishing very straightforward rules of conduct, um, how they were supposed to behave as members of the club. Here on the slide, you can see um, kind of screenshots of what I actually uh, informed my students about. Um, they are in L1 in Russian. Uh, let me sum it up for you. So first, uh, I was very clear about when, where, and how we were going to do that. I mean, when every week, every Monday, the, there was a new topic to be discussed in the club, where, on WhatsApp, and how, you know, using only voice messages and only in English. As I wanted them to engage with other people, not with me, I uh, established the rule of listening to others commenting on their voice messages as part of this, you know, establishing a dialogue. Um, I have already said that I wanted the club to be a warm, uh, accepting place for those who were not very confident uh, with speaking. So um, my goal was to establish this atmosphere of respect and addressing each other by their names and treating each other kindly and fairly uh, was part of that. Uh, I was also thinking about possible conflicts. I mean, this is something that needs to be considered at all times. And uh, I decided that I would be the moderator of the club and it would be up to me to resolve any conflicts. I, um, I think it was the last rule uh, on the list. It said that if um, you are offended by something or you feel uncomfortable, please let me know. I will do my best to resolve the issue. Actually, uh, it worked beautifully. So, a synchronous speaking and club. Um, to make it a club, like I think with any club uh, in real life, it has to be introduced as an idea, kind of sold to my students, even though it was free of charge for them. There uh, needed to be content, right, topics to be discussed and so on. And, um, uh, you know, the um, everyday management of it, the mechanics of it. Uh, and of course, if we're talking about a club, issues always arise and troubleshooting was also part of them of managing it. So, um, I decided to go very personal while introducing this idea. I contacted each student and informed them that I was welcoming them to the WhatsApp speaking club. I didn't use the I didn't use the word asynchronous because not everybody knows what it is. Uh, I used WhatsApp, which was you know much much easier to to understand. Um, when I was selling this idea to them, I stressed not only um, the opportunity of engaging uh, with the language, like practicing speaking, um, improving speaking skills. I also, um, I think, literally wrote something like, this is a chance for you to chat with interesting new people, meet new people, make, maybe make friends. And I highlighted the psychological advantages too. I was very, very explicit about where, where, and how it's going to uh, take place. And I invited them to contact me if they had any concerns, questions, and so on. The most important part was that there was already a starting date for the club. And um, 
I think that's hugely important if you ever decide to start a project like this, because having a starting date means that you uh, have already decided that you would do it with them or without them. This adds kind of a uh, gravitas to what you're doing. Plus, it lets them know that there is a deadline for them. I mean, they can think up until this date and then the club starts and they either take part in it or not, which also worked really well with my students. Then we have the um, matter of content. And I think these days it's super easy to find topics, questions, quotes, which can be discussed in a speaking club, online, in books, uh, wherever, whichever resource works better for you. There are literally very good books with already, um, you know, handpicked quotes or questions um, on different topics. You can use them as sources or you can use them as you know, a way of getting inspired and coming to come up with your own questions. Uh, if you uh, search for uh, ASL discussion topics or ASL discussion questions online, you'll get a ton of options. There are websites with like lists and lists and lists of questions on everything starting from apples to Xerox, really. However, I think that the best source of content is actually you. One of my colleagues, I remember, said that, well, you know, while choosing a topic, I always ask myself, what would I ask a friend? What would I be interested in talking about with a friend? If we're talking about, you know, a general English speaking club, it works really well. If you decide to do an ESP speaking club, then your students are experts. And the question you might ask yourself is, what would I ask an expert on this topic? You know, um, this will also work well. Uh, the only warning that I would have for you is that do avoid parsnips. Parsnips are topics that in general, uh, publishing houses avoid in their textbooks, um, and um, educational materials like politics, alcohol, religion, sex, narcotics, different isms, pork, and I would also add health here. Of course, it depends on the group of people, uh, on the clubbers themselves. But uh, my greatest flop um, in the club was when I you know, invited them to talk about COVID-19, thinking that they would really benefit from you know, practicing all the laxes and so on. No, nobody wanted to talk about that. In my experience, the simpler, the better, if we're talking about general English, at least maybe at the beginning. And then when you get the feel of the group that you have, you might introduce something more controversial. But do be careful. And um, the mechanics. Every Monday, uh, I commented on the previous week. Uh, I usually thanked everybody for taking part um, and maybe, you know, pointed out a few interesting ideas or sources and so on. And I sent posted uh, the new topic with a picture. Um, you can see on, on, on the slide what it looked like, right? Every week had a name. Uh, I wrote a brief introduction, and that was the only time um, actually anybody used text messaging uh, in the club. It was me introducing a new topic. And I offered different discussion topics, questions, quotes. Sometimes we played games. It all worked very well. During the week, um, I sent them sometimes reminders um, that, you know, there were new topics in the club um, to be discussed. Um, and sometimes I also shared extra resources, but they were actually extra because remember, my students always complained of not having enough time. So they could actually discuss the questions, uh, topics of the week without engaging with the extra resources. But if they had time and they wanted to, they were very much welcome. So I already started talking a bit about what I was doing during the week, right? Monday was um, the first day uh, the topic was introduced. And then depending on how the participants, the clubbers behaved, um, I um, either 
got involved into the in the discussion actively. I modeled um, the responses I expected them to um, to provide or shared my own experience. Sometimes, again, I um, wrote private reminders, like you know, do you remember to take part in the club. But if I felt that the topic just wasn't working, I let uh, I just let it be and. Sometimes you have to admit defeat. That was part actually of the troubleshooting that I had to deal with. Right? Participation was one of the issues. Um, another one was flops, the topics that didn't work, right? So my advice would be do not overcomplicate, at least at the very beginning. As for rule breaking, sometimes um, the clubbers did not follow the rule of comment on other people's messages. So I reminded them of that. And actually, I think um, a brief reminder of the rules at the beginning of each week, which I introduced later on in the club, uh, worked better than just letting them know the rules and then, you know, have a go at it. So did it work? To find out whether my students saw the benefits of such a club, I conducted a survey after three months of um, managing the project. I asked them these two very simple questions, among others, because it was actually a, an action research that I was conducting. So everybody wanted to continue taking part in the club, but you can see that not everybody took part in it. And the most common um, reason for not um, participating was the absence of time. <laughs> So actually, even uh, going asynchronous won't solve this problem for everybody, even though I think that mostly it's an issue of motivation, not actual time. As for me, I saw a number of benefits. First, linguistic benefits. My students definitely improved their fluency. Um, they got a chance to practice real life speaking strategies, which are hard, you know, to practice in class with the teacher, uh, no matter how much uh, um, I try and want to simulate uh, real life uh, communication. Sometimes the students didn't understand each other, so they had to explain, they had to um, politely take turns and so on and so forth. So th those were really great group discussions. Students sometimes even started sharing extra materials, articles, videos, and so on. It was real life communication. I was amazed actually at how well some of the weeks went. And of course, students picked up some vocabulary from each other. I could literally uh, hear the exact words somebody else said, you know, the previous week uh, in the club, in class the next week. And there were definitely psychological benefits. I did manage to create a community of learners where people felt comfortable, you know, speaking with, with each other. I had students um, from A2 to B2 taking part in the same club. And those who, well, were not as proficient as others uh, reported that they felt support and they were actually very keen on taking part in the club. And it was also a motivation boost, not only for my students, but also for me as a teacher, because I could see the results of what I was doing, <laughs> what, what I had been doing for years. Uh, you know, I was moved almost to tears the first time I listened to the messages during the first week. It was so great. So you can see that it was not that easy. It was quite a lot of work. So the question is, was it worth it? And for me, yes, definitely. Because the benefits outweigh um, all, all the hard work. Um, not only uh, linguistic benefits, of course, but psychological too. So that's my take on um, an asynchronous speaking club. Uh, if you want to um, you know, ask me questions, um, do drop me a line. Uh, you can see my contact details here on the slide. And you can use this QR code to access the presentation. Uh, the last slide actually here has some useful resources for those who would like to start a speaking club, asynchronous or not. Thank you very much for listening. It was a pleasure.
Thank you so much, Julia. That was very informative. And thank you so much for uh, sharing your ideas uh, with the group as well. And maybe people will have uh, questions, but they can send you an email. Uh, Definitely. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, you can see the uh, title of my presentation, the perception of EFS students on their online learning readiness and its reflection on their exam results. Uh, I conducted this study last year during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and first of all, um, under the, uh, with my supervisor, uh, Gül Hocam, Professor Dr. Gül Durmuşoğlu-Köse, I want to thank her uh, for her guidance and also uh, for letting me know about this conference. And uh, as we all know, um, proliferation of the online courses has changed the face of education. And of course, uh, in the last decades, uh, most of the higher education institutions and also universities added online courses to, uh, to their curricula. And uh, um, the main reason for students' preference of online courses was found to be the flexibility of time and space. And uh, students prefer online courses if they have, uh, especially if they have other commitments like full time jobs or families. And a sharp divergence uh, between the student uh, profile of online courses and uh, on campus courses was uh, noted. Um, by this in this in a study by Mahani and Hall, and more, uh, they revealed that most of the students who uh, prefer online courses were working adults. And also, of course, uh, in the last years, uh, Alan and Simon reported that there is a constant increase in the number of students enrolled in online courses, whereas uh, there is a decrease in the number of students enrolled and on campus uh, courses in the USA. And of course, uh, for the, uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we experienced a compulsory transition into online education. Both K-12 schools and universities uh, switched to online education in an emergency uh, situation. However, um, online education requires a lot of uh, preparation on the side of institutions and teachers and students. And of course, this uh, rapid transition brings a lot of concerns uh, like the students and teachers' readiness uh, and their technological competence and students' access to uh, necessary facilities and equipment, technological equipment, and their uh, online learning readiness. And uh, most of the studies uh, conducted in this field uh, were carried out with university students uh, who took online courses besides their regular on-campus courses or work in, with working adults who were uh, enrolled in a fully online programs. So that's why I wanted to conduct a study with freshman university students who were enrolled in a fully online intensive English program. Uh, this study has um, two main aims. The first one is to investigate the uh, difference uh, between high level and lo low level learners in terms of their online learning readiness and the relationship between their online learning readiness level and their exam scores. And the second one is to investigate students' perceptions about online English language learning. And the study uh, employed a mixed method design both qualitative and quantitative data collection methods were utilized. And for the quantitative data, online learning readiness scale, uh, which was developed by Hang et al. and translated into Turkish and validated by Yurdugül and Sarikaya was uh, used. And an online education evaluation form was developed um, for the qualitative data. This form uh, questions students' uh, opinions um, in several dimensions. Uh, like um, their participation, motivation during online education, and their per perceived advantages and disadvantages, and uh, their technological competence. And also a professor and two instructors field in the field um, <clears throat> reviewed this form, evaluated this form, and modifications were made based on their revisions. 
And this study was conducted in Andalu University School of Foreign Languages with students from two levels, elementary and intermediate levels. In total, there were 311 students and they are all of traditional university age and they're all native speakers of Turkish. And there were 165 female students and 144 male students. And both the scale and the evaluation form were in Turkish so that the students can understand it better, especially the elementary students, and they can complete it easily. And the school used a system, a platform called Megan, uh, during uh, the online education period last year. And the links for the scale uh, and the form were shared uh, as an announcement on Megan. And last year, uh, in all teachers created WhatsApp groups uh, for their classes as a school policy. And also students were reached out via WhatsApp and these links were shared in their groups. In total, uh, they were distributed to 966 students from two levels. 344 students responded to the scale, but after the elimination of recurring items and the answers of the students who did not take the midterm exam, there were 311 students for the anal data analysis. And 100 students completed the form. 51 of them were at element intermediate level and 49 of them uh, were at elementary level. And descriptive and inferential statistics uh, were utilized for the analysis of quantitative data and thematic analysis was used for the analysis of qualitative data. And um, uh, general info information about general demographics and also the study habits of students were also gathered uh, while administering the online learning readiness scale. And the results show that most of the students uh, who participated in the study attended the live sessions regularly. Only three students um, stated that they never attended the classes and they mostly use computers to follow the lessons and the least preferred device was, uh, was tablets. For the first research question, um, to investigate the difference between um, online learning readiness level of these two groups, overall mean scores were calculated and the uh, anormality test was run for these uh, uh, data sets. Since the data sets were normally distributed, uh, independent sample t-test was uh, used and the results show that there's a statistically significant difference between two groups and intermediate learners have a higher level of online learning readiness. And for the second research question to investigate the relationship between online learning readiness and their exam scores, their midterm, uh, their midterm results and the uh, average, average of their midterms and finals were taken into account. And again, the normal tests were run for these two data sets. And since they are not normally distributed, um, Superman's correlation coefficient was utilized. And the data set first uh, analyzed as a whole without splitting them into two groups. And there were significant correlation between uh, students' exams scores and their online learning readiness and sorry and then the data was split into two groups for elementary and uh, intermediate levels and uh, for uh, elementary students both uh, midterm results and average exam exam results were correlated with their uh, online learning readiness level but however um, for intermediate learners only average exam results was correlated with their um, online learning readiness. And although it was a significant correlation, it was a weak correlation there. And then five dimensions of the uh, scale were analyzed. The relationship between them uh, with their exam scores. And for intermediate learners, only two dimensions, learner control and motivation, were correlated with their average exam results. However, for the, uh, for the elementary students, 
almost all of the dimensions except for uh, computer internet self-efficacy were um, uh, that were correlated with their both with their midterm results and average exam results. Uh, with the co highest correlation, um, sorry, learner control has the highest correlation, and it was followed by motivation and self-directed di self learning dimensions. And for the third research question, so. Um, to, under, to investigate the perceptions of students about online English language learning. We use the data uh, coming from the online education evaluation form. The first question was about the advantages and disadvantages of online education. The students cited several of them. Let's go with the... Uh, uh, if we start with the advantages, Students generally are content with were content with the time left for themselves uh, because of their online education, and they enjoyed um, the comfort of uh, studying at home. And also, um, they some of them uh, cited that so it was an ideal uh, option for uh, pandemic conditions, and they also appreciated the. Uh, opportunities that the online education provides uh, to them, like the flexibility of the time and space and the recordings of the live sessions. Recordings were uh, recordings uh, were especially important for students who have other commitments like full-time or part-time jobs. And generally, uh, some of them also commenting on the quality of education that the school provided. They were content with it and they were content with the scheduling of the lessons since they did not uh, have to wake up early because the lessons started at 11 and they had only two or at most four hours of live sessions in a day. And, and of course, um, uh, during the face-to-face -face education, the students had to attend uh, a certain percentage of the uh, classes. But, however, during the uh, online education period last year, the school did not adopt a mandatory uh, attendance rule. So for some students, this was perceived as an advantage. And as for disadvantages, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, uh, elementary students were more pessimistic about disadvantages. As you can see, the number of students who did not find the online education as effective as face-to-face -face education was twice in elementary group. And um, for intermediate learners, the most frequently stated problem was that uh, the lessons were less social and less interactive. This was also stated by uh, elementary students. However, their biggest problem was concentration and self-discipline. As you see, the number of students who uh, stated difficulty in concentrating in online lessons and developing self-discipline uh, were four times was four, four times higher in elementary group, and both groups uh, uh, in both groups there were some students who did not find the lessons uh, as motivating as face-to-face -face classes. Some uh, stated that uh, they they suffer from the lack of the classroom atmosphere. And a few of them commented on the health problems related to the um, sitting in front of a computer. And also, unfortunately, some of our students uh, stated that they could not afford the necessary equipment for online education. And also, few intermediate students mentioned that they prefer paper-based exams. Uh, they are not used to online exams. And in the evaluation form, students' participation and motivation were also questioned. Um, most of the students who participated in this uh, study stated that they participated in almost all lessons or live sessions. and. Uh, but however, uh, a good number of students also 
asserted that their participation decreased during the term. So especially intermediate learners, since uh, they they have a higher level of oh my god, they have a higher level of um, proficiency and also they're more ready for the upcoming exams. Well, for motivation, most of the students stated that they have low level of motivation. And uh, uh, a, a good number of students also said that their motivation decreased during the term. However, interestingly, three intermediate students stated that their motivation increased as they witnessed their own progress and as they witnessed the quality of online education. When they understand that uh, they can benefit it from the uh, online education, their motivation increased. And as for interaction, they're generally uh, content with the interaction with their teachers and classmates, although they complained about the lack of social interaction. And of course, um, but um, a lot of students also mentioned that they are content with the uh, communication with their teachers, but they have limited interaction with their classmates. Of course, their expectations from friendships uh, was totally different from a teacher-student relationship. And during the term, uh, they all had the, their teachers' telephone numbers, and of course, they can easily reach their teachers. So this might affect their uh, perception. And they also commented on the online platforms they use and asynchronous lessons. Uh, they were content with the platforms, and but they had opposing uh, views on asynchronous lessons. Some of them find them effective. Some of them uh, uh, thought that they were not enough to prepare them for the upcoming exams. The students generally think that they are competent enough to uh, follow online lessons, but they experienced a power cut and loss of internet connection. And these are the general results of my uh, study. I mean, if I just quickly sum up the discussion part, as we see that the uh, there's a significant difference between online learning readiness level of elementary and intermediate students, and this can be attributed to the fact the high level of autonomy of uh, intermediate learners. And of course, uh, the for intermediate learners. Uh, the highest correlation was seen in motivation and learner control dimension. Also, this was uh, parallel to the findings of Kirmese in which uh, revealed that the most highly correlated uh, dimensions also with academic performance was also self-directed learner motivation and learner control. And of course, one of the main advantages of flexibility of time and space, which was uh, proved in uh, previous studies, and lack of social interaction was students' main complaints, and uh, which is also identified as a barrier uh, to online learning by Mullenberg and Burge. Self-discipline and concentration problems are also uh, big, most stated disadvantages, especially by elementary students. Um, several studies uh, also uh, asserted that found that self-discipline and motivation are indicators of academic success, especially for uh, low-level learners. And for example, Kasabala and Sartaj also pointed out that the online learning readiness level of students were not high enough to prevent them from uh, getting distracted by other online activities during these lessons. And of course, the importance, the results show the importance of motivation both the qualitative and the quantitative and, uh, data show this. And um, as we see that students find them, uh, themselves, perceive themselves really competent technology users. But however, they had problems uh, with um, access to necessary equipment. Uh, necessary equipment, uh, this, which was also portrayed in the study of Ferry et al., so which was conducted during the pandemic. And even the uh, providing necessary equipment is not only a problem uh, in unfortunate families, but also a problem for middle class families because of the number of siblings who attend the online session, online classes at the same time, and also working parents at home. 
for example, one of my students said that I cannot always attend the classes because we're six siblings and five of us are attending school. And for some of us to join the online lessons, the others must not attend. And as for the limitations and suggestions, this study was conducted at social level with uh, students from elementary and intermediate levels. So this can be replicated in other EFL and ESL contexts with uh, different age groups and less students at different levels. And also further studies can focus on the effect of other factors such as anxiety and gender on online learning readiness. And also the a lot of preparation is needed for the institutions and teachers as well. So their online learning, uh, their perception of online learning can be examined and teachers readiness and the e-learning systems of the uh, institutions can be evaluated in further studies. And of course, um, uh, some uh, interviews with teachers can also uh, show us more about the students' participations and their uh, experiences with um, the difficulties they experienced during uh, online sessions. Uh, thank you all. This is the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, these are the appendix, the uh, scales and the evaluation form. Great timing, Sinan And uh, Zeynep Hocam uh, will have a presentation in this concurrent session in, in in this afternoon sessions and uh, the title of her talk will be conscious apprenticeship of observation a practical activity to facilitate preserves english teachers professional development and uh, Zeynep Hocam is from Hakkari university from the department of english language teaching and the floor is yours Zeynep Hocam. Okay. hello everyone um hello everybody you know i have my friends here and uh, i'm so happy to see, see you all here and my presentation is Conscious Apprenticeship of Observation. And actually this is something that I figured out myself when I was teaching and I started to observe that it really works. And I wanted to share it with my colleagues to see if they have any further suggestions. And also uh, maybe they can also work to try it because it's so simple. And the second thing is I used it, before that I used it with uh, senior year students and third year students. But this year I wanted to use it with freshmen and I wanted to see if, we, if it really works with them and if it does, how do they benefit from it? And conscious apprenticeship of observation, what does that mean? This is the first thing. Uh, it's a kind of teacher development activity based upon researchers, professional practices and experiences. Um, so, um, how do I do it? The teacher trainer raises pre-service teachers' consciousness towards the class meeting, which they already finished by starting an instructional discussion on this observed class. So, for example, I'm teaching the class, whatever it is, it can be a skills-based class or it can be a kind of pedagogical one, it doesn't matter. But and the, uh, at the end of the session, I start a discussion, but this time it's a kind of colleague discussion you know, what they have observed, for example, what kind of group activities that we use, which one is much more beneficial. As a teacher, we are discussing on it. Or if something happens in the class, um, ordinary or extraordinary, it doesn't matter. We can talk about it as teachers. And I came up with principles of conscious apprenticeship of observation. The discussion sessions should be in a friendly atmosphere and the instructor and pre-service teachers should develop a collegial discourse. This is really important because I'm teaching and they're observing me and we should have a conversation, uh, having a kind of sincere atmosphere and so that they can understand or they can share their ideas easily. The discussions should be about recent experiences and observations so that they can remember what happened and how they felt or what they have um, taught about it, you know, all those things should be fresh. The topics can be selected by the instructor or raised by the pre-service teachers. It doesn't matter, they can come up with some issues. The topics can be about any issues about teaching, about methodology, testing, classroom management, instructional decisions and implementations, lesson planning, materials adaptation, or some other social things as well. 
And then pre-service teachers should take an active role in the discussions, but this should be on voluntary basis. If they, after some time, most of them become voluntary actually. Discussions should be conducted after the class and should be developed as a separate module. So we shouldn't allow those discussions to, in a way, um, distract the original sessions, original lessons. So they should have separate times. And I have two basic theoretical uh, discussions, which is, in a way, giving power to this application. Um, the first one is apprenticeship of observation, and the second one is reflection on action. And both of them are telling a lot about teachers, their beliefs, and their identity development. The first one, apprenticeship of observation, comes from Lorty, and most of the people who are interested in teacher education are familiar with, the, with this name. And he says that pre-service teachers come to the programs with preoccupied beliefs about profession. Uh, these beliefs are grounded upon their learner experiences and observations. So the apprenticeship means that we learn about teaching, we start to learn about teaching as a profession from the very early years of our uh, learner experiences. For example, you learn how to behave to a student when you observe your, your teacher in primary school, you know, and a lot of samples they accumulate together and they create your early beliefs when you go to the departments. And many scholars... Uh, uh, sorry, sorry for interrupting, but I couldn't uh, attract your attention. Uh, your, uh, this, you, you shared the PowerPoint presentation, but it's not, uh, you are not moving from one slide to another. Oh, because okay. I think you only shared uh, the, this version, not the slideshow, but the other one. Okay. Uh, okay. Let, let me try it again. So that the I'm sorry for this inconvenience. No, no, no. no. Um, sorry for interrupting. Okay. And I should say I can stop sharing first and then go to screen share and then go to. Um, is it okay, Hojan? Can you see? Okay. Yes, we can see. Yes, uh -huh. you have to click on the slides. Yeah. Is it okay yeah. now? Actually, I was <laughs> clicking on the slides, but it doesn't work. I don't know what the reason is. Okay. I think you can see this slide, slide about theoretical basis apprenticeship of observation. Mm -hmm. Can you? Okay. So, okay, thank you for warning me about this. So um, I was talking about Morty and his idea about teachers' observations, and we said we, we get those declarations from the very early years of students' experience. And many scholars are substantiating this argument by means of rigorous research. Um, and of course, we should say that some of these studies show that we learn about those experiences and we develop something based on it. But sometimes, uh, as Moody called, we have anti-apprenticeship of observation. And sometimes we, we learn what not to do as a language teacher. So whatever the type of um, learning that we get from those observations, anti-apprenticeship or apprenticeship of observation, it is true that as teachers, we come to the departments by having a set of preoccupied beliefs about this profession. So this idea, apprenticeship of observation, when I, when I think about it, I started to think that the, the, those three service teachers are observing us too, and we are a model teachers for them too. So if this apprenticeship of observation this much powerful, then why not to use it for the benefit of the students, I mean, student teachers. And the second thing is reflection on action. And in our field, we have reflective teaching and many research suggesting that reflective teaching to student teachers is important to help them learn about the things and delve into the ideas and, you know, figure out the things for themselves. Um, and this, uh, you know, we have reflection in action and on action, as Sean suggests. And I, I started to think that if reflection it works, you know, maybe I can use my, my classes as a kind of uh, reflection triggering action. You know, first the students are having the ex experience, classroom experience when they are learning this stuff, and then they reflect on it. What kind of reflection is this? This is both as a teacher and as a learner because they have just discovered the things as a teacher and also they experience the thing as a learner. For example, I use a different method for 
um, pairing, right? And then after this class, we started a discussion and we started to talk about, uh, you know, grouping the students. And then they say, as a student, I felt like that because they have a student perspective there. And also they say, as a teacher, yeah, that's true. This is better than that one. So they have double identity when they are reflecting on the thing. So we have the power of reflection and also we have the power of their dual identities during this process. Oh, I was afraid of this. Um, yeah. How about the benefits? Uh, Pre-service teachers focus on their recent learner observations, so they have a chance to reflect on the issue, both as a learner and a candidate teacher, as I mentioned. It can easily be integrated into the curriculum because the observed classes are the courses that pre-service teachers are taking as part of their pre-service training. So you can easily integrate it to any class that you're teaching. For example, I can use it for material development class, I can use it for instructional planning class. I can use it for a, a kind of skills class, let's say listening and pronunciation. It can be integrated to any lesson, so I mentioned that. Uh, I applied it with my third and fourth year students in the, in the previous years, and they said that, Hojam, we still remember what you were talking about and we really use it. So I, I understood that it really helps student teachers for their you know, professional development. And it has a kind of ongoing uh, impact on them so that they can use it when they start to teach after the training. Um, does this sound disturb the presentation? Should I, what, should I wait? I think you can continue. I, I can, all right. So uh, I wanted to share a couple of samples that I um, you know, did like with my students. For example, I was teaching lesson planning first and in the following classes, I was asking my students to figure out the lesson plan and then provide suggestions to me, right? During this session, apprenticeship of observation session, you know, they were suggesting the lesson plan that I have at hand. Or sometimes I was making adaptations in the material and then starting a discussion on type of adaptations and conduct conducted in this course and its pros and cons, of course. Using different grouping techniques, as I told you, or sometimes students say that they feel puzzled with the last point and they need time to digest it. Even sometimes I came up with some theoretical issues. For example, I could say, do you know about Piaget and equilibrium? What do you remember about him? So now you're in the stage of maybe this equilibrium. What do you think about it? And they say, uh-huh. You know, they, in a way, explain their learning experience by using the knowledge that they have learned in the department. Or sometimes I say, this is interlanguage, you know? You know, I, I was talking about second language acquisition courses. And I say, if you remember in interlanguage, the students may have a U-shaped uh, move when they are learning something. So you feel like you learned it, but now you cannot practice it. So you know the rules or the thing, whatever it is about language skills. And then I was combining their theoretical knowledge with their experiences. And this was a teacher to teacher conversation between my student teachers. And then used with their uh, feedback, I wanted to uh, design a kind of simple research with my freshman students in here. And, uh, you know, I was teaching oral communication one and two and grammar, contextual grammar courses to those students. And uh, 30 pre-service English teachers were taking the classes. And it was an online class because of this COVID-19 process. And then they answered the open-ended questionnaire um, by email. And we had a focus group interview. We, this was face-to-face. -face. And then I used uh, MaxQDA to thematically analyze the data. Then what happened? I see that. It really works with them, uh, specifically their professional motivation, belief system and identity is affected by these implementations. And also their teacher knowledge, I mean their knowledge about lesson planning and other stuff increased and also their skills about observing, conscious observation as a teacher candidate has improved. And then I, uh, you know, during this thematic 
analysis, I had some notes about their beliefs about the experience, and sometimes they came up with some suggestions that I also noted them in, you know, just to improve myself. If you have a look at the details, uh, um, if you have a detailed look into the themes, umbrella themes, uh, you see professional motivation, belief system, and identity. Motivation, you know, 15 times they, they said that they are now much more motivated to be a teacher. And they say they changed their beliefs about teaching. And first they were thinking that teaching is an easy task and everybody can do it, you know. It's, it's a simple thing, but now they understand that you have a lot of decision-making processes and you have a lot of information in the background. You just don't reflect it to the students, but in the background, as a teacher, you have to deal with many things at, at a time. So this changed their ideas and beliefs about their um, profession and also increased its, their motivation, of course. And they started to develop a professional identity. They, they usually said that, Hojan, we are first year students, and uh, even we don't understand if we are in a kind of teacher education department or not, because we are always talking about skills, grammar, and other stuff in the first year. And other pedagogical courses are, you know, they are not directly related to our English language teaching thing. But now, after having those sessions, we started to feel like a teacher, and we started to take more responsibility and we started to get a sophisticated idea about this profession and we developed a kind of respect and also uh, we, they, we i understand that they started to create a kind of imagined teacher identity at the very first year of their teacher education and the second thing is teaching knowledge and skills um, they became a kind of conscious observer and they stated that now we we observe the classes and we observe our instructors from this perspective. And now we question, why does she use this thing? Why is she doing this in this order? You know, now we can, uh, or, and also we can uh, think about the benefits of the activities that she's using or whatever it is. So they are conscious observers. Uh, and also they learned about instructional issues. <laughs> this is quite common. For example, they learned about individual differences, learner centeredness, learner differences, learner motivation, observing students and preparing classes accordingly, instructional planning, effective teacher attitudes, importance of having contingency plans, developing effective student teacher relationship. These are the things that they remember about their job, what they have learned about their job uh, with these small discussions, discussion sessions. And then I also looked at their beliefs about the experience. They said that Kojang, we feel like a colleague and this, this is really cool. And also we learned by doing and we loved the sessions and they found the sessions sincere. And they came up with some suggestions and they said, this is not face to face. So it, it was a kind of online discussion session it, and it would be better if you have face to face thing and if you have eye contact with you. And uh, maybe they said we can include issues, some specific issues like teacher anxiety. And also um, they really wanted to have what if questions. They are first year students. They are not that talented in using the meta language about the job, but they want to, they wanted me to ask questions. What if you were in this situation? What would you do? And start a discussion based upon their answers. And they wanted to, these, Sessions are mostly five minutes, or if it is extended, it was 10. It, it was really short, not to bore the students. And they said, we really enjoyed it. Why not extending the time? And also some of them said that, why not having a kind of micro teaching session based upon our discussions? Maybe we will enjoy it. And then after having all these things at hand, I came up with some conclusion. Uh, the activity is beneficial even for freshman free service English teachers, and specifically it affects their belief system. And we know that as teacher educators, changing or in a way um, having some, um, let's say, fine tuning with teachers' belief systems is not that easy because it's really strong. And at the very beginning of, the beginning of teacher education, it is harder. 
Uh, but here I see it affects the belief systems about teaching profession and increases their motivation. This is really important. And freshman pre-service English teachers even begin to develop a conscious teacher identity. So they, since they feel like a teacher, they start to feel like a teacher, they look around with a teacher perspective and they start to criticize us sometimes. Why do you use this activity? This is much better. You know, they have a conscious teacher identity. This is really important. Most of the times uh, we observe that the student teachers are at the graduation level, but still they don't have any idea about their identity, but they are still freshmen. This is a huge step for them. They develop their professional knowledge at very early stages of their pre-service education, so knowledge is increasing. Specifically, they, I see that they focus on the issues about learners because this is a kind of assumption, um, because they are still students. Uh, mostly they are still students. Their identity, student identity is much stronger they, they, than their teacher identity. And therefore they recognize the professional knowledge which are related to learner-centeredness, you know, individual differences, learner motivation, creating materials for uh, student interest and such things. They still focus on the learner part. They learn how to observe and analyze their instructors and they have so that they have self-monitored and conscious apprenticeship of observation. So as Lorty says, this apprenticeship of observation is inevitable. Why not having it, you know, self-monitored and conscious so that they will benefit it? You know, this is uh, another thing that I learned from it. And they enjoyed the sessions. So conscious apprenticeship of observation, it is economical and effective teacher professional development activity, which can be adapted to any course and employed at any level. So even from the very beginning, I think we can, we can use it as much as we can. So I just wanted to share it with you. And these are my references, which are supporting this idea, you know, and thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Zainab Hajam. Uh, my session is going to be about uh, online speaking classes. Uh, actually, I have a love and hate relationship with this class. I had I taught uh, speaking online uh, during the pandemic time, and I had sometimes it went very well. Sometimes we had lots of problems. So I decided to find some solutions to the problems, uh, and I want to share here what are the different solutions that I found, and what is the reflection of students uh, towards that uh, mainly. So my title is promoting interaction in the online speaking class mission impossible is it possible or impossible sometimes when i was teaching online speaking i felt it was impossible but sometimes using different kinds of applications uh, we made it possible somehow because we had to do that so we had to find solutions to the problems which were arising First of all, I want to give some brief information about online education. As you all know, this is not new in Turkey. And many different universities have uh, what we call them Uzaktan Eğitim Merkezi. So many courses were thought online before the pandemic as well. So uh, for example, common courses that everybody, all students were taking. And this kind of uh, provided some flexibility for the students. Uh, and it eased the, uh, you know, workload a little bit for the instructors. Uh, but when uh, it comes to emergency online teaching, uh, it put some more pressure uh, on the system and on the teachers, students as well. Okay, so uh, one uh, theoretical framework, uh, when I was researching, I came across the technology acceptance model, and I found this very relevant to what we are trying to do. Um, so this is developed by Berkeley et al. in 2018, and it focuses on the critical factors which influence students' perception and use in online learning settings. So what affects their perception? What affects their use? It's a quite comprehensive model. So I look, uh, wanted to talk about this a little bit in my presentation as well. So if you look at this chart here, the 
um, technology acceptance model has some different components like external factors and internal factors. If you look at, for example, the external factors, uh, the social norm, university climate, instructor engagement, access to computers and system availability, all of these uh, affect perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use. Also, computer self-efficacy combined with other factors affects perceived usefulness on part of the students and perceived ease of use. And this is reflected in their attitude and intention to use. So if all of these factors are not really realized, then the usefulness and intention to use uh, does not really happen. And we may not have much motivated students to use. Uh, so these are actually, when we look at our, when we think back uh, our experiences with online teaching, uh, you must have, we must remember students, uh, for example, complaining about access to computers, complaining about system availability, connections, and so on. So this model actually puts uh, it in a very concrete model, uh, which explains all of the different factors. I think it's useful to uh, look at this when you are designing an online education system. And uh, so these are the explanations of each of the components. For example, computer self-efficacy. Uh, is an individual's perception of his own abilities to use the computers. Uh, when the pandemic started, I had a confidence in my own uh, computer self-efficacy. I had a high uh, opinion of that. And I had also more uh, you know, confidence in teachers, uh, students, let's say, uh, capabilities of using the computers. But when the application started, actually, I was kind of, uh, you know, um, dissatisfied or with the students, uh, you know, abilities, I, I valued their abilities more. So I thought students would not have any difficulty connecting because they are already familiar with computers. They like using computers and so on. Uh, but later I started seeing lots of technical difficulties. I had to, I had to give them uh, lots of feedback instructions on how to use the system and so on. Uh, and social norm, for example, is relating uh, informational uh, influence, which occurs when a user accepts information obtained from other user as evidence about reality and influence. Uh, so here, the social norm, uh, I think, is something related to the new environment which we suddenly had to uh, you know accept and we created a new social norm uh, in online education and the university climate for example i think in turkish institutions uh, the university climate is kind of debatable because you know there are the systems there are subscriptions of universities to different applications but when it comes to real use lots of problems arose uh, because, you know, the uh, help, guidance, encouragement provided by the institution is very important. We as instructors, uh, you know, we strive to help our students, guide our students, but we, have, we also have to be supported by the institution, the wider institution. If we don't have support from the institution, uh, we may not be able to help the students very much. So the university climate is also very important in the success of online education. Of course, access to computers uh, in public universities. I think this was one of the most important problems. Many students didn't have access to computers. Many of them didn't have access to stable internet connection. They had internet connections, but they were not very stable. And in a class like speaking, I felt uh, these problems more and more. And uh, there are five levels of possible adaptation to the e-learning system in the literature. Uh, the first one is web-assisted course. Uh, the second one is web-enhanced course. It's blended online course. 
hybrid online course and intensively or exclusively online course. So when the pandemic happened, we moved from web assisted courses. I can call our pre pandemic courses web assisted courses because as language teachers, I think we are using the web as a very valuable resource. Everybody's uh, using web resources. So we jumped from the first level to the last level, which is exclusively online course. And of course, this created some problems uh, and challenges for us. Okay. So uh, as I said before, these have a degree of you know, technology involvement. And the last step, the fifth step is the highest one. So, uh, there are advantages and disadvantages of the online environment as well. So it's convenient in time and space and in the pandemic situation, it provided us a safe environment. Uh, and it also provides uh, opportunities for independent learning, the quality of information. You can share more information maybe through uh, technological channels and flexibility for students and instructors is another advantage. Uh, and also uh, opportunities for the institution to extend its borders uh, to other geographical regions. So you can teach, uh, you can offer, for example, online courses to even students in other countries. This is another advantage. Uh, the challenges, the disadvantages are, for example, uh, these are related to planning, setting up related infrastructure and training. So we didn't really have a chance to get training and we familiarized ourselves with the system uh, by uh, using it like it was like uh, learning to swim after jumping into the ocean, right? On part of the teachers, uh, the drawbacks are students missing lectures, technical complications, and the lack of institutional help and training. I cannot say that I didn't receive help from my institution. Help was available, but training was not available. So maybe if training had been provided, I would use more, uh, you know, all aspects of the application, uh, I would not use it in a limited way, but I had to explore what else can I do with this application? I had to explore it and find it uh, in my own way. Okay. And also students intention to use the online environment, their motivation to use it or their happiness level, how does that increase? According to Berkeley's study, uh, there have to be supportive cultural practices, access to computers, uh, system or online environment availability, of course, self-efficacy for using computers and users' perception of usefulness and ease of use are important. So uh, now I will talk about my study. In my experience, I had to use a different, uh, you know, combination of different applications in order to make the speaking class more effective. I was using mainly four different applications. I was using Adobe Connect uh, officially subscribed by our university as the main teaching tool. I was using Zoom as additional uh, backup tool when students lost connection or they couldn't uh, connect to the microphones. Zoom was easier for them, so we shifted to Zoom sometimes. Uh, and also I used it as an exam environment and I used Zoom uh, for students to prepare some assignments. And WhatsApp was also used as a backup tool. I used this more synchronously. When I asked the question, if a student had a malfunctioning microphone, they could make a quick recording and send it to me uh, just after I asked my question or raised the discussion topic. And Edmodo was used for sharing class content, collecting and grading assignments. So I can show you some uh, the Adobe Connect screen. For example, here we, are, we were doing some kind of an online quiz. This was a fun activity. Here I can see my students' names, but as you can see, the only person uh, who has opened the video was me, because when I asked students to turn on their videos, they either said, I'm uh, not in a good mood or I'm not dressed well, 
or the environment is not good, there are people here, it's going to get noisy and so on. So they had lots of excuses and also technical problems. They said, I cannot get my uh, video to work or I don't have a camera and stuff like that. So all I could see was students names, I couldn't see their faces. For that reason, I used uh, Zoom so that I could see students faces like you can see here. If they use Zoom, it was easier for them to turn on their videos somehow because Adobe Connect uh, was more challenging for them to use. And also I use Edmodo to share, uh, you know, assignments, homework, materials with them. And I use WhatsApp as well. So in the study, I designed an online survey and asked students their opinions about, let's say, um, the class and the applications that I used. There were 72 students in the class uh, and we uh, did our class, as I said before, with a combination of four different applications, but main one being Edmodo, uh, main one being Adobe Connect, sorry. And how about the questionnaire? The questionnaire focused on uh, students' uh, attitudes towards enjoyment, their perceived enjoyment of the activities, because the speaking class is supposed to be fun. And if students are motivated, they can learn better, I think. Comfort while using the applications, uh, promoting interaction, perceived usefulness for learning, increased motivation. And the last part of the questionnaire uh, was about asking students to compare face-to-face -face education with online education. And it was a five-point Likert scale questionnaire. And also there were some open-ended responses. Uh, a total of 52 students responded the questionnaire on an online survey tool. Okay, as far as the results are concerned, uh, in terms of enjoyment, uh, as you can see here, uh, the it's blocking the way. So uh, students, I think, enjoyed uh, using enjoyed using uh, Edmodo and Zoom more than Adobe Connect, as you can see here. So Zoom was rated higher uh, in enjoyment compared to Adobe Connect, and uh, they also rated Edmodo positively. Uh, and in, in terms of interaction, uh, WhatsApp and Zoom were rated higher than Adobe Connect, as you can see here. In terms of comfort, uh, students felt more comfortable using Adobe, uh, Edmodo, WhatsApp, and Adobe Connect. Uh, and Zoom was rated low here because I think the Adobe Connect was provided by the institution and uh, they were, you know, using it uh, more comfortably because everything was on the website, it was accessible. But when it comes to Zoom, we had to uh, always, I had to send them the links and they had to connect and so on. And in terms of learning, uh, they rated Edmodo uh, highest because I think there were more uh, resources were there and they could use the resources for learning. And also they rated Adobe Connect equal with uh, you know, WhatsApp. Here, I didn't put Zoom because Zoom was not really the main tool for learning. Uh, and uh, if you look at some you know, transcripts also, I had a look at the transcripts of some talks in the class. So I just wanted to see how interactive can Zoom make the class. For example, in Zoom session here, four students are having a, a group, uh, you know, discussion, and you can see they are using sequence organization and they are helping each other overcoming their anxiety. Uh, sometimes and students actually feel anxiety because of the video camera. And uh, I can see that there was a, you know, um, the synergy between the students and they were helping each other overcome anxiety. So this was uh, something good. And also, uh, really uh, similar to real life conversation, they use examples, they use opening and closing conversation tools for opening and closing conversations, and they didn't have much difficulty organizing the turns, uh, who will speak next and so on. They uh, use these tools well. 
And also they can they reacted to others, they use turn taking techniques and they interrupted each other. So when they got used to using these online tools, uh, the interaction happening there started to resemble real life interaction. So uh, their experience was not totally negative. Uh, there were some also positive aspects to it, we can say. And um, okay, when it comes to comparing it to face-to-face -to -face education, this is, I think, the most important part. Although students uh, found it useful, enjoyable, okay, but but when you ask them to compare online teaching in speaking class to face-to-face -face education, their preference was towards face-to-face -to -face education. As you can see from the chart, most the responses here, the strongly, uh, the activities during Adobe Connect sessions motivated me to learn the class content more than the ones in the traditional face-to-face -face class meetings. So here they are, they think that Adobe Connect is not of course, uh, better than face-to-face, uh, -face, uh, they disagree with this statement. So they prefer face-to-face -to, -face to Adobe Connect. Although it makes it flexible in time and you know they don't have to travel to school, but still they would prefer face-to-face, -face, of course. And how about this one? Uh, I participated more in the Adobe Connect sessions in comparison to the traditional face-to-face -face class meetings. Here, students again disagree with this. Um, they think that their participation was higher in face-to-face. -face. And also attention in terms of paying attention to class, they think face-to-face -face was stronger. And also uh, participating in group activities, they prefer face-to-face. And also there were some open-ended responses, but I think uh, maybe we can just show a couple of examples, just one or two, if it, uh, can you see the screen changed? Okay, so for example, uh, if you look at here, uh, these are about the advantages of using Adobe Connect in the speaking classroom. Uh, for example, our teacher can share any video screen or slide with us. So sharing different kinds of media, I think they liked uh, being able to see uh, these on the same screen and so on. So if there's no sound problem or net problem, everyone can attend the lesson at the same time. So this is, we can watch lessons later. This, the lessons were archived and they could watch them later. If they missed the class, they had the opportunity to watch it later. So they liked that. And a couple of students mentioned the same thing. Um, also, also, there are some negative uh, things as well here uh, we can reach it the got stuck i mean we don't see the excerpts so it says open-ended responses ed model on the screen right now ah you cannot see it okay maybe i can refresh the page very quickly and unfortunately we've run out of time so no, i'll ask you to rest it, it up yes right in, for in example fonts yeah okay so here, our teacher can share any video screen or slide. Let's go back to the presentation very quickly then. Let's not lose time. Okay, so now the next thing is the advantages. There's a word cloud here, you can see it. So um, they said, uh, you know, for example, Adobe Connect advantage, easy uh, internet connection and microphone. So these are things which affect the usefulness and advantages. And uh, disadvantages, you can see connection problem, internet connection as the uh, you know, most bigger font here. The most important problem was uh, connection and internet for them. Okay, so as a conclusion, we can say that students, uh, when they experience different applications in uh, speaking class, they had a relatively positive attitude uh, towards them in terms of enjoyment, comfort, interaction, and learning. Uh, according to the uh, TAM model here, for example, what affected them the most was access to computer system availability, as I can see from their responses. Uh, so they are not totally against it, but however, when they are asked to compare it with face-to-face -face learning, they have a tendency towards preferring face-to-face preferring -face teaching. 
And uh, technically, uh, as there may be implication, technically our inst institutions are not at the desired level in supporting students to provide equal access in terms of access to computers, connectability and technical support. So here students are left to their individual means. I think there should be more support in public universities to support students' internet connection. Somehow a solution has to be found. And also this was about speaking class. The uh, study can be replicated with other language skills classes, which do not require interaction. When there's, in, there's the need for interaction, online, uh, the internet connection and stuff like that affect it very negatively. And for example, listening, reading, writing, or grammar in different kinds of courses, there may be different kinds of responses from students. Okay, thank you for your participation. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Hojan, for this informative session. So, Nurojan, the screen is all yours. The title, <laughs> you. as you can see, is Musicians of the Titanic, an EFL teacher's classroom management experiences during COVID-19 pandemic. Here you go. Yes. Thank you, Jim. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all having a productive day, nice day. I'm uh, Nur Surutshan, and in this session, I will be telling you about a study that I have conducted recently. It is called Musicians of the Titanic, and EFL teaches classroom management uh, experiences during COVID-19 pandemic. And this is the outline. We're going to start with the problem statement, then move on to the methodology. Then we will discuss the findings one by one, and we will conclude with further implications, hopefully. And uh, having experienced a COVID-19 pandemic over quite a some time, educational fields, as you know, have gone through various shifts. Uh, which brought up the terminology ERT. ERT means emergency remote teaching, and it's different than online teaching, as you know. And this transition has positioned as a novel uh, source of challenge for students, teachers, and also parents. And it is assumed that there would be alterations in their teaching methods. And uh, this uh, change in the delivery mode might just, uh, just as well be reflected in the teaching practices, including their classroom management strategies. I also wanted to share a, an inspirational quote by Kumara Vadivedu uh, with you, because that has inspired me. Uh, teachers need to be supported so that they would develop the knowledge and skill, attitude and autonomy necessary to construct their own context sensitive pedagogic knowledge. So therefore, this study uh, aims to examine an English teacher's experience in managing classroom of young learners during school lockdown last semester, actually, and uh, with the ultimate aim of empowering reflective practitioners in these gloomy times, which has reminded me of the brave musicians who kept playing as the Titanic started to go down. And there are two research questions. Um, the first one, what are the strategies used for classroom management in ERT during COVID-19 pandemic? And the second one deals with the teacher's own view on classroom management. As for the methodology, it is safe to say that this is a single subject case study. And these are the bullet points that I will be elaborate on. And uh, as for the participants and contextual information, the participant is 27 year old female English teacher with four year of experience in teaching English to young learners. She works at a private school and she teaches 28 lessons each last about 30 minutes per week. The age range of the learners is uh, about six to, not, uh, six to eight. And the teaching, teaching materials are standardized and provided by the institution itself, not by the teacher. Uh, and there are four main sources, uh, three main sources of data. Uh, first one being observation. 
Uh, the second one is weekly reflection reports and semi-structured interview to reveal teachers all new on classroom management. And this is the uh, very rubric that I have used. As you can see, the first column deals with the description of the management strategy. What did the teachers say or do? How did the teacher make students aware of the expectations, et cetera? And the second uh, column deals with students' responses. How did the students react to the teacher's behaviors? And the third one belongs to my reflection notes and comments, what I thought about what was going on. As for the data analysis, uh, 20 sessions of 30 minutes of online classes are recorded by the teacher and observed by the researcher. Observed data is recorded according to the uh, rubric that I have shown you. And uh, as for uh, weekly reflection reports, I've chosen it because critical self-reflection is considered as a crucial ground for decision-making practices of teachers. And a semi-structured interview uh, was used for elaboration on the potential problems and developing practices derived from observations and vehicle reflection reports. And these data uh, was analyzed by using in vivo coding framework uh, under qualitative approach of Saldana and uh, emergent themes has, have been derived from the data and verbatim extracts, and they were categorized as codes, which eventually lead to the themes. And the themes uh, are designed as descriptive labels that bring the codes together, and they're also color-coded uh, to ease up the process. And as for the trustworthiness of the study, the questions designed for weekly reflection reports and the semi-structured interview are checked by an expert in ELT with a PhD degree. And uh, I have used uh, another researcher's opinion to check the codes and themes. And um, uh, the key respondent uh, made sure that the interpretation of the findings reflects uh, her own true colors uh, to ensure that there are no misinterpretations. And this is uh, a sample of codes and themes I wanted to show you. For example, this is observation number three. These are the verbatim extracts. And uh, the second uh, column shows the codes, like please wait, uh, complaining about exercises and, and all. And uh, they lead to the themes. They are descriptive in nature. And um, again, my notes to remember the themes, how to describe them. And uh, let's look at the findings one by one. The first research question, what are the strategies used for classroom management in online teaching? Um, as you can see, observation uh, data has brought up um, to uh, four main sources of uh, branch, like learners with various roles, teachers with resources and roles, and system uh, with internet connection and computer related issues, parents with certain roles. Uh, and um, as for the teacher, she made use of the resources for, such as reminders, actions, and clarifiers to sustain the ongoing learning environment, but, uh, while soother and troubleshooter as a role was used for addressing the momentary problems and ensuring a stable learning experience. Uh, for the learners, uh, they come with various roles uh, in the sessions. For, for example, rule benders, boat trackers, and ship sinkers uh, were potentially more destructive to the classroom management than the other uh, roles. And uh, for parents, intruders and personal trainers, uh, they were involved in the ongoing classroom activities, such as uh, kissing their children, bringing food, and yeah, that happened. And um, saying the correct answer, for example, and yeah. So system uh, comes up with the 
various problems such as internet connection and computer related issues like slow computer, uh, the teacher gets cut off and another student takes upon the host and shows the video all chaos like uh, they occurred okay, occasionally and they hampered the ongoing learning climate. As you can see, these are teachers' uh, resources and their roles. For example, for reminders, uh, she uh, uh, reminded the students of the face-to-face -face, uh, rules they have a certain classroom etiquette, you know, uh, how they should behave, like sit down properly, turn on your camera, rotate back your camera, write your name as username, et cetera. She reminded them of the uh, rules that they have because they have still rules. It's not like out of the blue because it is ERT, et cetera. And actions ask stu students about their lives at the beginning because students need to, you know, uh, let some steam off because uh, they are in their homes. They want to show off their pets, et cetera. They're so excited because their friends are in their home. Uh, and so on. As for the second finding, uh, the teacher's own view on classroom management in online teaching, the semi-structured interview uh, came along. Um, at the beginning, uh, she uh, immediately compared face-to-face -face and ERT. Uh, and she has uh, stated that Advantage of ERT is the continuity of education during pandemic with minimum damage in general and the future of mute all. Because we don't have a mute all button in a face to face, you know, it is like a magic wand to her. And as for the disadvantage of ERT, the students facing the screen constantly because they were having like eight uh, sessions a day, you know, can you imagine? And they were having adaptation problems because a school lockdown and not lockdown like face to face, they were coming back and they were forgetting their books at the school. They don't have any book at home and so on. And lessons learned, uh, this is from reflection upon her own classroom management. The teacher criticized her insistence to resolve the misbehavior and loss of time and energy. She just uh, could, she wished uh, she could just move on, go past it because she lost so much minutes on one incident. And self-evaluation parts, uh, providing clear rules, reminding them tirelessly, applying these rules, being patient and calm uh, were her strong suits of classroom management. And she was not aware. And uh, potential, a threat to classroom management uh, were found as students' adaptation problems, uh, distractors as being neighboring atmosphere and the people, and a toolkit for classroom management was found to be clear instructions helping students to acknowledge the rules and have a specified or lesson organization overall, alternative solutions to technical problems, like as soon as possible because time is gold. And on having an unbending time, the teachers makes room for the students to blow off steam a proper time to do talk about whatever they want because they want to, you know, play with the screen, share their pets, I don't know. They, they want to do that. So that's why she had such thing. And as a result, uh, affecting factors and properties of teachers' actions to compose uh, the classroom atmosphere as conducive to learning were displayed in an interwoven network. So each and every one is related. And I wanted to show you some bullet points. And this, these are, of course, come with a context behind, but just to uh, give you some brief idea. Remind the students that there are still rules similar to face-to-face. -face. Allocate specific time for specific behaviors like eating, going to bathroom, playing with the pets during break time, not uh, in the class time. Have a personal chat, fun time at the beginning because students uh, need that. Uh, come up with, a so with solutions ASF or be at least mentally prepared for the technical problems because it can happen to anyone. 
so just don't be upset uh, about technical problems. Don't take too much time fixating on a problem, move on if possible. Because one time uh, the students came up with a, a username, like anonymous username, he is mysterious. And this, the teacher couldn't move, on, move past that. Like she uh, spent entire 40, uh, 40 minutes, no, 30 minutes of lesson on that student. So that was just a waste of time she realized afterwards. And parents might act as a source of distraction with good intentions. And time in ERT is gold, losing five minutes is a big price. And mute all, as we said, is a magic wand for calming down the students immediately. And students need to be in a quiet place with less distractors around. And students might bend the rules, get creative with technology, divert attention, or get distracted very easily. And they may take upon diverse roles in sessions. Like uh, he may be a rule follower and ask about the finish time tirelessly as being a poll tracker, for example. And they might seek visual attention from others. These are displayers. And the word problem is the trigger word. If one is having it, others share theirs. Like, I can't hear teacher. No, I can't either. If the, my sister is playing with me, et cetera. And sometimes the digital born and raised to students brief the digital race about the platform because they know about computers and they know about Zoom. Like, teacher, I made this emoji. And teacher doesn't know how to do it, for example. And teacher tends to reflect on negative experiences more, which is sad actually, and shows me that there is a need for empowerment right there. So um, as a result, uh, when we look at the previous, uh, previous literature, and of course this is face-to-face -face literature, this is not ERT literature, but uh, it's like a reflection because uh, for example, learner misbehaviors were also encountered in the ERT period, such as talking out of turn becomes muting, unmuting without permission. Insulting rules and procedures uh, becomes complaining about the exercises or waiting. Roaming in the classroom becomes leaving the screen, going to the bathroom, and so on. And uh, considering the management of noise and time, the future of muting and unmuting and ticking clock is very handy and the strategies utilized by uh, the student teachers in the study of pure soil programs are found to be existent in the pre present study in different versions for example eye contact has been filtered with the screen so the teacher often reminded the students to look at the screen not to leave the screen etc and as for the uh, practical implication the teacher training programs might include such ERT practices into curriculum so that the adaptation of teachers would be much less troublesome. And as for the platform itself, it might be at, it might add uh, more convenient and easy to use features because drawing a shape or annotating on screen take a considerable time. And additionally, the parents need to be informed upon how they can be a part of this process to support efficient learning because they come with good intentions. You know, they do not just uh, kiss their children to uh, divert the attention or something. And further research might take upon uh, distinguished longitudinal case studies. For example, the transition from ERT to face-to-face -to -face as a classroom ethnography might take upon. And such research might guide uh, teachers to reflect on their journey and also help empowering them to feel uh, more chivalrous, just as the musicians of the Titanic in these unsettling times. And this is the end of my presentation. I thank you and ask you if you have any questions or something you would like to share. Nurojam, thank you very much. Uh, you have finished on time. Uh, I, I, in fact, we have one minute. If there are any questions, well, if there is only one question, we can take that question. 
but I guess uh, people were so fascinated with the presentation, oh, they didn't you, even Jessica, use the chat box. Uh, it was, uh, I'm into young learners myself, and it was really a very, very informative presentation. Thank you for sharing this with us.